eyes, it would look like a constantly changing bundle of twisted fields, curling between sunspots, stretching and reconnecting as magnetic energy is released in flare explosions. To see what happens to all this energy, we need to tune into the radio emissions produced by the accelerated electrons spiraling rapidly high up the magnetic loops. The most sensitive radio telescope on Earth at centimeter wavelengths is the VLA, the Very Large Array, near Socorro in New Mexico. It has 27 dishes, each 25 meters in diameter, arranged along three arms up to 21 kilometers long. When all the dishes are close together, it is ideally suited to imaging rapid events over the entire sun. As the dishes are moved wider apart, they effectively zoom in to see smaller regions in finer detail. The VLA has taught us a lot about the solar flare process, which we could not have done otherwise. For example, by observing at different wavelengths, you can actually observe several different layers of the sun's atmosphere and their effects in the sun's corona. So the difference in altitudes between them may be of the order of several tens of thousand kilometers. The picture at 20 centimeter wavelength lies way above the picture that we saw at 6 centimeter wavelength. And this is primarily because the radio emission is generated by energetic electrons which uh, spiral around the lines of force in the sun's corona. In other words, it actually maps the strength of the magnetic field in the flaring region. The magnetogram is at the photospheric level, whereas the computer field lines are in the corona. And the blob that you see it actually is at an altitude of 130,000 kilometers. And the separation between the two foot points is something like 200,000 kilometers. And this particular burst lasted only about three seconds because the beaming electrons actually took that much time to move from one foot point to the other foot point. You also notice that uh, the same thing is happening over and over again. It is due to a succession of radio emitting electrons propagating from one foot point to another foot point at very high speeds of the order of one third the velocity of light. And that explains why these bursts are so rapid and last only a short time. Such flares also emit X-rays and gamma rays, which, unlike radio waves, do not penetrate the Earth's atmosphere. This hard X-ray imaging telescope, called HIDI, will be carried by a high-altitude balloon over 40 kilometers high to record solar flares. It is designed to stay up there for eight hours or more. Why does it have to be so long? The reason is that hard X-rays and gamma rays can't be focused by lenses or mirrors. We need to use another trick, and the trick we use is analogous to that of a pinhole camera. We use grids this is a sample, about a centimeter thick, made out of tungsten, a very dense material. The grids, about this diameter, have slits and slats in them. The slits let hard x-rays and gamma rays pass. The slats are thick enough to actually stop the energetic radiation that we're trying to image. Now, what we have done in the actual balloon payload is use pairs of these. The pair works together something like this. What I have here is a film that's actually a contact print of the grid that I just showed you. If I have them so that the slits in one piece of film cover the slats in another, you can't see through it. But if I move them, keep them straight, you see the opening, and now the light, analogous to the hard x-rays and gamma rays, can pass. Move it again, and I can close them up again. So that's how it really works, except that we separate it by large distances to get very fine angular resolution out of the system. When the telescope is actually operating, the grids rotate synchronously to give us the opportunity 
to reconstruct images of the sun and its solar flares in two dimensions. To understand the complete picture of the sun's atmosphere, we've had to open up regions of the electromagnetic spectrum that are accessible only from rockets and satellites, namely the X-rays and ultraviolet regions. For example, this ultraviolet image here shows the network structure that is much coarser than granulation, like a hairnet stretching across the sun. In close-up, we can see the hairnet structure in more detail, and a thin, very hot transition layer at temperatures of 100,000 degrees, just above the much cooler photosphere. We can also see a faint loop stretching high into the even hotter corona. The temperatures in the corona can be as high as 2 million degrees. Computer modeling has shown that plasma waves driven by magnetic forces can provide much of the heating. When particles are moving this rapidly, they emit X-rays by collisions with one another. This picture of the sun was taken with a rocket-borne X-ray camera. It shows plenty of flare activity, especially above sunspots. The temperatures here can reach 20 million degrees or higher, enough to trigger short bursts of nuclear fusion. And in 1991, the Japanese Yoko satellite provided this spectacular series of images, revealing a wealth of detail never seen before. We see phenomena on both local and global scales, from tiny transient brightenings in dark coronal holes to vast interacting loops and flares. At the edge of the sun, these loops may be seen as great arches of matter, lifting free of the sun's gravitational pull, driven by flare energy. Sometimes a cloud of this matter escapes and starts a long journey across the solar system, a coronal mass ejection event. The clouds grow too dim for direct imaging, but they can still be followed. We can track these clouds by looking at the scintillation or twinkling of radio sources around the entire sky. Just as a star twinkles when you look at it through the Earth's atmosphere, a radio star twinkles when you look at it through these coronal mass ejected clouds. In this full sky scintillation map, the sun is just north of center and the red regions show regions where the radio stars are scintillating very significantly. So this enormous red region to the upper left shows a large mass ejection cloud passing just to the left of the earth as you look towards the sun. To the right of the image, we see a quiet sky where we simply see the mottled effect because of the radio sources themselves. There is no event in the solar system in that location. Clearly, some of these clouds can collide with the Earth and have dramatic effects. Not all of these effects are as beautiful as the aurora, where electrons enter the upper atmosphere and can interact with the oxygen and nitrogen atoms, causing beautiful displays of light. The magnetic fields of the mass ejected clouds and the Earth itself can interact and that can cause significant navigational problems. It can cause significant pulses in power generating circuits and a whole host of other effects. Fortunately, most of the mass ejected clouds will miss the Earth and just travel out through the solar system. But how far do they go? What do they do beyond the Earth's orbit? Well, the Voyager spacecraft have now passed beyond Pluto and Neptune, the two outermost planets, as they pass through the solar system. Recently, they have detected radio emission apparently coming into the solar system of frequency about one kilohertz. This uh, radio emission seems to coincide with the time that coronal mass ejections reach the outer reaches of the solar system. And it seems that the mass ejected events, in fact, are interacting with the very edge of the solar system, the heliopause, which is where the magnetic fields of the solar system literally merge into the magnetic fields of interstellar space. So after their phenomenally successful planetary mission, it seems that the Voyager spacecraft are now giving us information on the very edge of the solar system. As we've seen, astronomers can now combine optical and radio images from Earth with images from space to open up the entire spectrum, including the infrared, ultraviolet, as well as X-rays and gamma rays. Each wavelength region probes different levels of the sun's atmosphere. 
Only by looking through all these windows can we begin to see how it all works. Will all this data be enough? Is our sun special, or can we see similar phenomena on other stars? Here in California, at the center of extreme ultraviolet astrophysics, they have detected huge flares on other stars. All stars, except for our sun, look just like points of light, even with the world's largest telescopes. So the only way you can see a stellar flare is by looking for a sudden enhancement or brightening. When we were checking out the instrumentation on the Extreme Ultraviolet Explorer satellite, we were fortunate in detecting just such an enhancement. The intensity of the star increased almost a factor of 10 in a very short time. We were also fortunate in that we were using the spectrometers at that very same time. So we had a record of the spectrum of the flare while it was taking place, which we can compare with the spectrum obtained before the flare took place. And the results then tell us what are the plasma conditions in this stellar flare. The flare we saw was some hundreds of times more intense than any flare ever seen on the sun, which is rather a good thing, actually, since such an energetic event on the surface of the sun would have devastating effect to life on Earth. The upper atmosphere would be ionized and all communication would be disrupted. We'd have a daytime aurora, which would be quite spectacular, but in the long run, the ultraviolet light would reach the surface of the Earth with devastating consequences to life. The question is, why do these flares take place? Another question is, why is the corona, the outer reaches of the sun, have such a high temperature? It's at a temperature of several million degrees, but the surface of the star is only 6,000 degrees. How can such a cool surface heat up a high temperature corona. We don't know the answers to this, but we hope to find out by studying EUV radiation from other stars and see how they compare with our own sun. So by investigating other nearby stars, we will be back.